Good afternoon, everyone. Um, today, it gives me enormous pleasure to welcome people back in person to the Royal Society, as well as hopefully very many of you watching on uh, YouTube at this moment and also post this lecture. Okay? It is amazing what technology is able to do right now. And some of that technology is technology which is driven by a study called condensed matter physics. And today we have one of the leading researchers in condensed matter physics, Professor Stephen Blundell. Uh, he is currently a professor at the University of Oxford and is also a fellow at Mansfield College. Um, his work is on condensed matter physics, as I said. He's written several books. If you are about to become an undergraduate, you will meet his Fillmore Physics book, which is written together with his wife, Catherine. Uh, it's the one that I recommend to all my undergraduate students. Uh, if you're younger, there are books on superconductivity, a very short introduction. And as you become more advanced, there's also a quantum field theory book uh, to look at, too, all of which are absolutely wonderful. Um, so without further ado, uh, I want to introduce Professor Stephen Blundell. Um, there's a bit of technical housekeeping, uh, I should quickly say. Um, up there is a QR code. I would recommend that you use your phone now and take a picture of the QR code because we'll be using this Slido web page for Q&A. So whether you are online or whether you are in person at the Royal Society, we'll be submitting questions through Slido and using that particular website and that QR code. Um, so when you have a question, put that down. We will, at the very end, be reading through and then selecting questions to give to Professor Blundell. So without further ado, uh, Professor Blundell. Well, thank you very much for that kind introduction. It's a great pleasure to be here. And can I add my congratulations to all the winners and participants in the Physics Olympiad. You've, you've uh, all done brilliantly. So I hope you've got the QR code now. I'm going to move on to my talk. Uh, the title is The Many Universes of Quantum Materials. So here is a picture of the universe, or a part of the universe, taken with an astronomical telescope. And I guess many of you who are wanting to do physics are lured in by the beauty of the night sky and wanting to understand cosmology in the universe. And that's a fantastic way of getting into physics, looking at things on the largest scale and asking questions about where these objects in the universe come from. Or it may be your entry into physics comes through um, thinking about the smallest possible particles, the things that make up the universe. So in other words, you might be drawn in by particle physics, asking these big questions about uh, what are the, the fundamental particles and what makes up fundamental particles and what's the physics associated with this. And therefore, you would be interested in digging up half of Switzerland to build an enormous ring to accelerate particles around and smash them into each other to try and understand things about, about particle physics. And I guess one of the things in physics which is, makes it a bit different from other subjects and probably why you're all physicists and wanting to, to do this is because as physicists, we don't have to remember too much because we always go for the fundamental equations. You know, if you're a painter, then your productivity is measured in how many paintings you produce. Or if you're an inventor, it's how many inventions do you make. But actually, for a physicist, you might think it's about how many equations you, you generate. But actually, physicists like reducing the number of equations. We like unifying things. So where you had a theory of electricity and magnetism, it was unified to make electromagnetism. And where there was a theory of the weak interaction, that was added in to make the theory of the electroweak. So we have this feeling that maybe if we can really progress physics enough, there'll just be one equation, a grand unified theory that will describe absolutely everything. And future physics A-level students or Olympiad students will only have one equation to remember, which will be the fundamental one. So wouldn't that be nice? Well, there's a problem with that. And I think to think about this, let's ask fundamental questions in a different way. What's the world made of? Now, there have been different answers to this question over the years. So, you know, originally, somebody, this is going back to the Greeks, somebody said everything was made of water, or possibly everything was made of air, or somebody else came up with the idea that everything was, was, was made of fire. And then the kind of interesting idea that came after this um, was from Empedocles, who um, was the first person to really say, well, maybe it's not just one thing, it's lots of things. So maybe the world is made up of earth, fire, air, and water. Now, of course, we've moved on a lot from those four elements, but this idea that maybe 
the world is more interesting if it's made up of more than one thing, and maybe if there's more than one equation to describe it, that's potentially significant. Now, we also know the world is quantum. Now, what does that mean? Well, just to give you quantum mechanics in a slide, and this is only obviously part of quantum mechanics, it had been known for many years that there are particles in the world, small bits of matter, and uh, uh, you can represent a particle by, by a function that just is, has a spike. The particle is there, but it's not anywhere else. Or another possibility is that the world is made up of waves. And in fact, we know that there are things that are particle-like, like electrons, neutrons, protons. We know that there are things that are wave-like, like light, for example. Um, but in fact, in quantum mechanics, things got a bit muddier, so we discovered that actually light can behave like a particle. It can be a photon. Or indeed, electrons, protons, and neutrons, they can behave like waves. So this sort of muddies the water. So in quantum mechanics, you have to kind of think of, well, maybe the world is made not just of particles and waves, but things that are neither one or the other. And of course, this blows people's minds. How can you be both a wave and a particle? Well, actually, as mathematical physicists, we can describe this very easily, because you can think of having a function with a slider on it, and we can slide all the way from particles to waves. So that's what I've got in this animation. You can see the little dial is dialing up to the particle side, and then we turn the knob and we dial to the wave side, and you can see you can write down a function which somewhere in the middle, when the, the dial is halfway in between, you've got something that's got a bit of wiggly waveness, but it's all, also slightly localized. So that essentially is the mathematics behind wave mechanics, which is at the start of quantum mechanics, something that's neither a particle or a wave. And so this is what we think the world is made of, neither a particle or a wave, but something in between. And in fact, the modern picture is that the universe is permeated by quantum fields, light, electrons, protons, everything. There are these fields that exist throughout the universe. And in fact, the particles are just the excitations in this field. That's the kind of modern picture of what the world is made of. Now, of course, when you start putting all these fields together, they do funny things. You know, we, quantum mechanics, in one sense, is quite straightforward, and you can write down the Schrodinger equation. But when you put lots of things together, then you start getting things like this, chemistry. And of course, you're all physicists, so you know, this is, this is uh, something that probably makes you recoil in horror at the complexity of the periodic table, because you don't want to remember all of this stuff. But it turns out, of course, that the periodic table is what makes everything. And the funny thing is that things are next to each other in the periodic table are quite similar. You've just added one extra particle, but they're completely different. Now, this periodic table was designed by Mendeleev in the 19th century, and he had this idea that what you need to do is look at these different chemical elements and look at their mass number and order them as, as, in order of mass, and he generated this beautiful pattern of the periodic table. And quantum mechanics does explain this. But there is a bit of a complication, because if you look at, the, for example, one part of the periodic table, and you've got the mass numbers in the top left-hand corner, and you can see them going up, uh, for those of you that can read the text, one of the things you might notice is that there's a bit of an anomaly here because the numbers are going up. But when you get to tellurium, yes, the numbers are going up, but then it goes down again when you get to iodine. So something's a bit odd here. And it took until the 20th century to realize that you shouldn't be ordering these in terms of mass. You should be ordering them in terms of charge. And uh, so it's charge that's important. And that's what gives you the atomic number, the number that's in the top right here. 47, 48, 49, 50, that's the number of charges on the nucleus. And this realization that actually what's important here is the electromagnetic interactions between the nucleus and the electrons. That's what's giving you these chemical properties. But quite how these different properties of something shiny like silver or something rather dull metal like tin or something that's a liquid like iodine or xenon, which is a gas, and they're all next to each other, this is kind of rather a surprising thing. So what's the world made of? Uh, it's made of these strange um, atoms. And something else that we know is that electromagnetism, if electromagnetism is part of this, and it does seem to be because charge is what orders the periodic table, then something that you know, and this is essentially Maxwell's equations in diagram form, if you have a positive charge, electric field lines fly out. If you have a negative charge, electric field lines fly in. But magnetic field lines only go around in loops. They never end or start on a charge. So it seems that there are no magnetic charges in nature, and that's something I'm going to come back to later. So this is something that comes out of Maxwell's 19th century theories of matter. Now, 
One of the problems we have if we're trying to understand how the universe works is we're actually stuck with the fixed rules of the universe. So we can say there are these particles that we've found, there are these particles that we haven't, like magnetic monopoles. They don't seem to exist. So we're stuck with fixed rules, and also the physical constants take certain values. So we've got a fixed set of particles, fixed set of parameters, and, and a whole lot of other things are, are all fixed. So the problem is essentially we've got one universe. And one of the questions we might like to ask is what if the rules and the parameters were different? And the problem is we can't do that because we only have one universe. Well, what we really want to do is make more universes. And that's, of course, rather, rather, rather difficult. Is there a way to explore that? So in the field of condensed matter physics, we have a way of doing this, how to change the rules. And the point is, what we can do is we can make crystals of interesting materials. And each one is actually a new universe. Each has new rules, new fields, new particles, new parameters. So this is really what I'm going to talk about uh, today. Now, how do you make these crystals of exotic matter that will demonstrate these properties? Well, some of them you can dig out of the ground, and you'll see some of them are actually quite common compounds. Um, some of them look rather complicated chemically, so you might look at this bottom line of some of the interesting quantum materials that people are studying and think, yes, that looks a bit like chemistry. I'm not sure I'm that interested in that. But as I'm going to show you, they give you new universes, and there's really cool physics to be extracted. So, yes, some of them are really very complicated indeed, um, chemically, but maybe physically they're rather beautiful systems. How do you make them? Well, what you can do is you can make crystals. This shows you a light furnace. This is our light furnace in Oxford where some of these things are made. And if you look at them on a microscopic scale, this, of course, is a model, uh, but you can see these beautiful atomic structures uh, that look quite complicated. But as we'll see, they give you rather beautiful properties, each one a new universe. OK, let me give you a very simple example that I think you're probably already very familiar with. You can change the speed of light. And you all know about that because of refractive index. The refractive index of a material tells you that the speed of light is different if you've changed the refractive index. So for example, in diamond, light travels two and a half times slower than it would do in a vacuum. So of course, you can tune the speed of light. That's a very simple example. Um, and this occurs, I should say, because each of the carbon atoms in diamond have, has an electric charge around. And so when light goes into diamond, it gets absorbed by the electrons and then re-emitted. And that whole process of cascading through slows it down. That's one way of thinking about that process. But you can do more interesting things than this. So for example, if you take a crystal of calcite, um, which has this rather interesting helical structure uh, inside it, then you've probably seen this. Calcite gives you this interesting double refraction. And this is because the speed of light is different along different directions. So you get these interesting double images that you can see in calcite. OK, these are very simple examples. I'm going to go to some much more exciting ones in the rest of the talk. But before I do that, let me just step back a little bit. I talked at the beginning about the theory of everything. And in condensed matter physics, we actually have the theory of everything. It looks a little frightening, uh, but this is basically a thing called the Schrodinger equation. It's written in the top part of the slide as just a very simple equation telling you about the rate of change of a wave function. And it's to do with this thing called the Hamiltonian, the thing with the curly h, which is an energy function. And that energy function, the Hamiltonian, basically contains some terms that involve kinetic energy and potential energy. So the sort of thing that you've seen lots of times in A-level physics. Now, it's just looking a little bit complicated here because you have interactions between the nucleus and the electrons in the system. And the other problem is you see all these sums all over the place. This is because you have to sum over all of the atoms in the crystal and over all of the electrons, and there are a lot of them. So that's the problem. But basically, we have the theory of everything. It's called the Schrodinger equation. But it's this fact that we have a large number of particles gives you new stuff. And here I have to quote the Nobel laureate Philip Anderson, who came up with this interesting phrase, more is different. So let me just contrast it with, you know, if you're of an ecological persuasion, as we all should be, you would say, small is beautiful, more is worse. You know, we should be simple in our lifestyles. If you're a, an out-and-out -out capitalist, you'll say, more is better, more consumption, more everything. Um, Philip Anderson's idea was more is different. And his point, really, was that 
Um, essentially, he was trying to say that when you have more atoms, more than just one, you actually get new properties. You get something different. It's not just more of the same. New things happen. And he was really trying to make a distinction. He felt this very strongly when he wrote this article in the, in the, in the 70s about um, people pursuing fundamental physics versus people play, um, uh, pursuing applied physics. So and if, if you like, this distinction between the laws and the laws in action. And people might say, and you might say as physicists, well, actually, what I'm really interested in is discovering new laws. I'm not so interested in those laws in action because that's just working out the details. And his point really, and this is my point today, is that actually working out the details and seeing how simple laws give you complex behavior is actually where the really exciting physics at the moment is. And one way of seeing this in a way is that you all know how to solve the two-body problem. I think you've been doing that in some of the physics Olympiad problems. I doubt they've set you too much on the three-body problem because that's really insoluble except in simple cases. You know, four-body problem, forget it. In condensed matter physics, we have to deal with the 10 to the 23-body problem because, as you probably know, the Avogadro number, the number of atoms in a mole of material, which is a typical macroscopic lump of material, is something of the order of 10 to the 23. Okay, two-body problem you can do, three-body problem challenging, 10 to the 23-body problem, that's going to get hard. And one of the reasons it's very hard is because very often in thermal physics, as you'll, you'll discover later, one of the things you have to do when you have to work out configurations, different possibilities of macroscopic matter, is you have to take the factorial. There's an N factorial that goes into thermal physics. Factorial, remember, is when you multiply each number by... Um, the one below it and the one below that. And if you try and work out 10 to the 23 factorial, uh, maybe this was a physics Olympiad problem, you discover that it's 10 to the power of 2.26 times 10 to the 24. So one with something of the order of 10 to the 24 zeros after it. So, you know, that means for a, a macroscopic lump of matter that you can hold in, in your hand, the number of um, configurations that it could possibly adopt is more than the number of atoms in the universe. So if you, if you employed every atom in the universe to make a computer, you still couldn't enumerate all the possibilities. So that really is something, I think, rather, rather significant. In fact, even if you, if you have the numbers much slower, think about biology. There are 20 different amino acids. So if you make a protein of L amino acids, there are 20 to the L possibilities. So if you have a protein which only has length 58, making one proton, sorry, one protein of each, just one molecule protein of each, would give you something that has a, a weight more than that of the observable universe. And in fact, in the human body, the mean length of proton, uh, proteins is 476. So you'd need 10 to the 500 observable universes to make each possible protein, just one of each. So this shows you that uh, there are some rather interesting issues that occur, even with relatively small numbers, because you're taking exponentials and you're taking powers. OK, let me say something else quickly about complexity. So I don't know how many of the people in the room, how many of you have seen Conway's Game of Life? Is anyone familiar with that? A few of you are. Great. OK, so it's, it's a known thing. That's very good. John Horton Conway was a mathematician, and he came up with a very interesting idea. He did this in the 1960s, so he could do it with graph paper. Now you can download apps on your phone that will generate all of this. And the basic idea, it was a little game. You can do it on graph paper or squared paper. You colour in squares. And the rule is basically the following. So you can make little patterns of squares. You either colour the square in, and that means it's dark, or you leave the square blank, and that means it's dead. And you have these four rules, OK? The four rules are, if you have a black square, then if it has fewer than two nearest neighbours, um, then in the next round of the game, it's dead. You have to rub it out, OK? Rule number two um, is if it's got two or three black squares around it, it will live on to the next round. Um, if it's got more than three, it will die. Now, the idea here, he was kind of trying to see if he could make a two-dimensional model of evolution. So the idea is if you haven't got very many nearest neighbours, uh, you, you starve. Um, if you have the right number of nearest neighbours, you can carry on. But if you've got too many more, too, too many, then you're overcrowded and you don't survive. Um, and 
The other thing is if you're a white square and you have more than three nearest neighbours, you get colonised. So you then live in the next round. This is the basic idea. So you have these four rules. And so in this particular case, we have the theory of everything. It's just like in condensed matter physics. So we know everything about this model. Okay? Now the question is, just because you know the rules, is anything interesting going to happen? And uh, Conway tweaked the rules until he found something that was really rather rich. So let me just show you how it works. So here are some starting configurations. So um, immediately you can probably do some of these in your head. So the top left one, one by one, it hasn't got any nearest neighbours. So that in the next round, it will die. Similarly, the two by one, that will die in the next round. But if you take the two by two, each one of those squares has got three nearest neighbours. So that will just persist. So that's a stable state. OK, so we know the f one, one times one and two times one will die in the next round. Two by two will just persist. And, and the others, well, I could probably think about it, but it's going to, you know, it's, it's, um, you could work it out with some graph paper. Now let's just see what happens. So now what's happening, I'm going to let them go. And you can see one by one and two by one, they did indeed die. And two by two was indeed a stable state. Um, but you can see some of the others ended up in all kinds of strange things. And so, again, if I just rerun that again, you can see the starting states. And now I let them go. And you can see some of them do some really quite complicated things. That one on the, on the, on the right was very, very odd. And the one down at the bottom is still going. So th this is very odd. Um, let's, for example, take this T state and see what happens when I let it go. So I now iterate it using the rules of the game of life. And you can see that this has now ended up into some stable oscillation into this sort of blinking state that carries on. And I'm just rerunning it again there. You can see the pattern. Um, now let's try a T with a sort of side piece to it. So I've just added one extra pixel. Um, and now I'm going to let it evolve. And this one goes completely mad. OK, you get all kinds of fireworks and things flying off. So this one is um, extremely complex behavior, just one different pixel and it does something crazy, it's still going. The debris is just flying all over the place. It's extraordinary. In fact, in the game of life, you can do all kinds of things. So you can make flying objects, they're known as gliders, and you can make things called spaceships, which fly horizontally. And in fact, um, you can define a speed of these objects. So there's a speed of light in this model. The speed of light is you move one pixel per round, and in fact, you can show that you can't go faster than c over 2 in the game of life. It's an interesting theorem that can be proved, although the diagonal gliders, they fly at c over 4. And you can do all other kind of strange things. So there's a glider, there's a spaceship. There's one of my favourite, which is a Canada goose, it's called. And you can kind of see it looks like a Canada goose. Again, all we're doing here is iterating those rules. And uh, if we really want to get complicated, this is a Canada goose um, with a payload. So I think this will just start again. So this is just basically pushing, um, it's like those space shuttle booster rockets or something, the Canada Goose is flying these things all over the place. And you can do collisions, of course, I'm a physicist, so I've, on the, here I've just coded up some collisions. So here is some uh, gliders flying into each other. They started in slightly different positions, so that one ends in a stable product. Uh, this one gives you an oscillating product. Um, uh, this one, you get a glider emerging from the, uh, from the debris, and this one, the one on the far right, just basically you get shrapnel flying all over the place in a sort of firestorm, oh, and ending up in some kind of stable state. Um, and here are some spaceship collisions as well, where you either get annihilation, glider creation, that one turns into two gliders, that one gives you a stable product, and this one gives you a thing which is known as the pulsar, so I've just got that sketched on the bottom. You get this sort of funny, bleeping, persistent thing with these... Um, flashing parts. So uh, I must admit, when I started uh, thinking about the game of life and thinking about it as a physicist, I thought, well, actually, what you really need is some emergent rules. So you can write down things called Feynman diagrams, which you normally use in particle physics, but you can write down the Feynman diagrams for the spaceship and glider collisions. So the, for those of you that know what Feynman diagrams are, these are the Feynman diagrams, two spaceships colliding and giving you a pulsar. Now, um, one final example, I thought I'd try genetic modification. So what we have here on the left is the, um, the, the, the Canada goose. And on the right, basically what I've done is I've removed one pixel from the Canada goose. It's one of the ones right at the bottom. 
And um, having just slightly um, taken away one, one pixel from the Canada goose, you can see that the poor Canada goose explodes on takeoff. So these things are actually quite fragile. Just taking out one of these, uh, 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 one of these pixels is enough to blow the thing to smithereens. So this is giving, again, an example of the fact that complexity emerges even from very simple rules. So with the more complicated rules, I guess, of the Schrodinger equation, it's not surprising that we live in a rich and diverse and complex universe. OK, so let me come back to condensed matter physics in the last part of my talk. Um, so, and I've, I've got about 15 minutes to go, so that will leave plenty of time for the Q&A. So we have new particles in condensed matter physics. Uh, one of them is a very simple one, so we have things called holes. You've probably heard about these in semiconductors. So in a semiconductor, you have the valence band, which is filled of electrons, and the conduction band that is, is empty, and you can promote electrons from the, conduction, from the valence band into the conduction band. This, of course, is very important. All our iPhones work on this, uh, so this is the foundation of so much of our technology. But there is an interesting philosophical point here, because essentially... The holes in a semiconductor, they're just absences of electrons. So you could argue, do they really exist? Is a hole a thing? And it's much the same if you look at a fizzy drink or a beer, you see bubbles, and your eye is drawn to the bubbles. Um, but actually, a bubble is really just the absence of beer or the absence of Coca-Cola or whatever it is you're drinking. Um, but we think of the, bit of, of the uh, bubbles as real things. I mean, they, they, they don't seem to obey the usual rules because they go upwards, whereas normally gravity would be pushing you downwards. So they somehow seem to have negative mass. So we're all familiar with looking at bubbles, really. We're just looking at the liquid flowing around it. But similarly, in semiconductors, holes end up being a real thing because even though they're an absence... Now, of more interest, if you take something like a mass on a spring, um, here are some masses on springs, uh, then we find from quantum mechanics, as we saw right earlier, that even a light wave can be quantized in terms of particles. And so we find that even in masses on springs, there is a quantum of excitation that we call the phonon. And uh, you can see phonons in this little um, animation here. You can see the individual atoms inside um, a... Uh, a hexagonal lattice, all vibrating. Now, of course, this is a classical picture showing you where atoms are actually moving, but it turns out when you start using the mathematics of quantum mechanics that there are particles associated with each of these vibrational modes, and these behave like real things, like real particles. Now, something I'm particularly interested in is doing this with magnetism. So, for example, if you take spins, magnetic spins inside a lattice, you can set up oscillations here. Again, I'm plotting them in a classical fashion. Um, here again, you can see a picture in, 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 in more dimensions of the uh, uh, two dimensions of one of these so-called spin waves. But again, these can be um, quantized, and we call these magnons. And here's another picture of, a, of another type of magnon. I hope this is not going to mesmerize you too much uh, if you stare at it for too long. Um, but there are particles in here. And how do we know this? Well, because we can do the standard physicist thing of bouncing other particles off them. So this is the Rutherford Appleton Laboratory, which is sort of halfway between London and, and Oxford. And here we have X-rays, we have neutrons, we have my own particular interest, muons, and we can use these to study these particular types of excitations. And so there's the A34, for those of you that know Oxfordshire. And, uh, and also, this is essentially what we're doing. We're bouncing these particles off these phonons or magnons, and we're learning about them. So we can do elastic collisions with these particles that have come from these vibrational waves, either of atoms or of magnetic spins, and we can measure what's going on. Now, there are other interesting things as well. You all know kinetic energy is a half mv squared, I'm sure, as physics Olympiad experts. Um, it turns out inside matter, that relationship can become more complicated because of the periodic nature of the crystal. And it turns out the kind of thing that you might get is a slightly more complicated thing than a simple parabola. So you know, it looks a little bit more like spaghetti, the relationship between energy and momentum, or energy and velocity, if you like. But this means that we have new universes of electronic excitations inside each of these materials. And we can measure this using uh, various different techniques. So uh, we can measure um, angle resolved photoemission, or we can do a whole range of other things using Fermi surface measurements and high magnetic fields. 
And one of the recent discoveries or series of discoveries that's happened in the last sort of 10 years, we've realized that in graphene, you have so-called Dirac electrons. This is a model that Dirac came up with in the 1930s uh, of a linear relationship between energy and momentum. Uh, and this has been realized inside graphene, although you find there's a new speed of light. The speed of light is, is the usual speed of light divided by 300. And it's a linear relationship. We've also discovered things called vial fermions, massless chiral fermions. So these are particular types of particles that have a chirality, a handedness associated with them, like your left hand and right hand are different, but are related uh, by a simple symmetry transformation. So these fermions are related by um, a chiral transformation. We also have things called Majorana fermions that have been discovered in a whole range of different materials. These are fermions which are their own antiparticle. And they are named after um, an Italian uh, physicist called um, Ettore Majorana, who, look him up on Wikipedia, he disappeared in unusual circumstances and uh, was never found again, although I think there's now some theories of what happened to him, but he just vanished at one point in the, you know, almost like his mysterious particle. Um, but Majorana fermions posited as a theory of neutrinos in the early part of the 20th century, uh, now realized in materials. And a very good example of these sort of unusual quantum emergent properties is superconductivity. And so this is a picture of a superconductor um, levitating above a magnet, a photograph I took in my office. So I, I was there with a camera. So you know, it's unbelievable when you see this, but it works. And superconductivity, one of the most mysterious and exciting properties, um, Fritz London, uh, a name who should be better known, was instrumental in really understanding what's going on in superconductivity. And one of his big ideas, I'm just going to take it, you through it very quickly because I think it's a really important idea, is a thought experiment. So take a black box. Okay? Uh, you, could, you could maybe have an external power source, but I'm not going to allow that. Okay? So there's no external power source in this black box. And you take a magnetic compass and you go around the black box and you measure the magnetic field. And what you discover is that there is a sort of usual kind of permanent magnet, kind of magnetic field around the box. So that's your measurement that you make with your magnetic compass. So the question is, what's in the box? And your first idea is, well, there's a bar magnet. That would fit the experimental data. OK, sounds very good. But there's another possibility, of course, which we know since the work of Ampere, um, so, which is that we could have an artificial magnet. As you know, you can make magnetic fields using a coil and a battery. So the question is, which one is it? Is it the bar magnet, or is it, if you like, the artificial magnet? And they would both give you the same field pattern outside the, the black box. So how do you know which one it is? And again, I think I could... You can think about this particular problem, what could you do? I'm not going to allow you to shake the box because uh, I don't want you to destroy what's inside it. But one of the ways you could find out which one it is is to wait. Because if you wait, the battery will run out. Okay, so you come back you know, a week later, the battery will have run down if it was the artificial magnet. But of course, if it's a, if it's a permanent magnet, it will still be going. It'll be going like that for, for years later. Now, there's another possibility, of course. It could be a superconductor, a superconducting ring with a persistent current. Because we also know that a superconducting wire, if you set up a current in it, it will go round and round forever. So the interesting thing is the superconductor is more similar to the bar magnet than it is to the artificial magnet, the coil with a battery, because the superconductor doesn't run out. So that makes you realize, well, if I want to understand how a superconductor works, I really ought to understand how a bar magnet works. And this is one of the reasons why, in my research field, I work on both magnetism and superconductivity, because there's this connection. Now, the reason the bar magnet works is because the magnetic field is coming from electrons which are going round and round an atom, and they don't need a, a battery. That current goes round and round forever. And what Fritz London realized, and this was his phrase, he said a superconductor must be a giant atom. So the quantum mechanics that is giving you a coherent state and allowing an electron to go round and round the atom forever must be the same thing operating in, in a superconducting coil. Now, when superconductivity was discovered in 1911, the transition temperature was very low. Um, you know, it was discovered in things like aluminium, which you make your pans out of, so rather boring things. Um, as 
time went on, superconducting transition temperatures increased. In fact, the ones in an MRI magnet are the ones based on these niobium alloys that were discovered in the 60s, so this technology is still being used. Um, so if you have an MRI scan, you will be inside a superconductor, you'll be inside a giant atom. So something to remember if you're ever inside an MRI scanner, you're inside a giant atom. Um, and, of course, this is also the technology that goes towards the CERN accelerators. But there were big discoveries in the 1980s and, and beyond where we worked out how to make high-temperature superconductors. So, again, chemically complex materials where the transition temperature, that's the temperature below which superconductivity works, got higher and higher. So superconductivity went from being a really low-temperature phenomenon to one that was getting towards room temperature. And, in fact, in the last few years, it's been going up and up, and we've just gone through a record transition temperature. We've hit room temperature. You can see in the slide I've actually lowered room temperature to make it hit room temperature. But I think, you know, if you have a cold room, this will work. Now, the problem with these latest discoveries is they only work at very, very high pressure. So you need a pressure about half that at the centre of the Earth. So these are not practical. But it shows it can be done. And this is something we've waited 100 years for. So we really are on the threshold now, I think, of developing new superconducting materials that will be even better. So this is where the future of quantum materials is. It's getting electrons in these complicated materials to demonstrate these beautiful properties of quantum mechanics. There's a whole lot of other things I could talk about. Um, fractional quantum Hall liquids, string liquids, spin liquids. This is something that I'm working on uh, myself at the moment. But I wanted to finish with a simple example that I think will appeal to you. So... Let's go to, back to something very basic, um, magnets. You all know that magnets uh, repel or attract depending on whether you have the like poles or an unlike po poles uh, next to each other. So this is something you all know. You also will know that you can't um, make single poles. You always have a north pole and a south pole. This is another way of saying what I was saying earlier on, that you can't have magnetic charges. So if you take, if you take a magnet and you try and cut it in two, uh, then... The problem is that you end up making a new North Pole and a new South Pole. So we don't seem to be able to make magnetic monopoles, but in fact, there's a clever way of doing it. So let me give you a picture of how this works. It's a little bit of a cheat, but there's a really clever idea, I think, in here. So if you take a periodic system, so this is a model of my crystal, magnets north-south, north-south, OK. Here's the idea. What we'll do is we'll take one of the magnets and we'll rotate it. So now we've got two south poles together and two north poles together. So if you like, we've got two magnetic monopoles. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to rotate one of the other magnets, and now I've moved this double north and double south apart, okay? And then I could carry on doing this, and I could move them further away. So here's another uh, um, uh, picture of the same thing. Uh, I've now may reverse one of the magnets, so I've made a, no a double north and a double south, and now I've moved them further apart just by rotating magnets. So if I think of these double north and double south as magnetic monopoles, I've kind of done it. Seems a bit of a cheat. But let's just see if it works inside a crystal. There's a way of doing it. So what we can do is take this particular crystal. This is a, a material called dysprosium titanate. So I've actually subtracted out some of the other atoms, and I'm just focusing on the magnetic ones. It turns out they have a very complicated crystal structure, and they exist on tetrahedra, and the tetrahedra are all corner-linked. So what I do is I have a magnetic moment on every corner of one of these interlocking tetrahedra. And the rule is that the magnetic moments can either point into the center of the tetrahedron or out into the next tetrahedron. And then the next rule, it turns out, in this little game, is that in each tetrahedron, you have a two-in, two-out rule. So every tetrahedron has two spins pointing in and two spins pointing out. And I've drawn this network of tetrahedra so that that rule is satisfied. And yes, we have a material that embodies this model. Now, the interesting question uh, that one of my colleagues in Oxford thought of was what happens if we take one of those magnetic moments and we reverse it, just like in my model of the, of the, of the magnetic moments. What we then do is we end up with two tetrahedra where the rules have been broken. So we've now got the blue one, which has three pointing in and one pointing out, and the red one, which has got the opposite. It's got three pointing out and one pointing in. And then what I can do is flip the next. You see what I've done there? I've just flipped that next 
spin, and I've now moved the defect further away. And I can even flip another spin and move it further away too. So what we have here are north and south poles which have been separated, and they can move independently. So a number of us have then been studying the behaviour of these magnetic monopoles in these crystals. And in fact, if you take a crystal of this material, the monopoles are all moving around. And one of the ways we know this, uh, here's a picture of this crystal that embodies magnetic monopoles that you can hold between your thumb and forefinger. And in fact, one of the things that we can, we can do here is we can measure the, um, the fluctuations inside this crystal. So this is actually the, the null signal when we measure an empty coil. Now let's just see if I can get the sound to work. So this is the audible sound that comes out of the crystal. I hope you can, you can hear this. And now we put the crystal in. And you can see the noise spectrum is quite a lot bigger. Now we've taken the crystal out. And we're now going to put the crystal back in again. OK, so you've heard the sound of magnetic monopoles. These were the, the, the first sound of magnetic mo monopoles we could, we could measure. The great thing is the fluctuations all turned out to be of the order of kilohertz, so right in the audible signal. So we could take the output of this uh, squid uh, measurement system and plug it into a loudspeaker, and then you could hear this fluctuation spectrum. OK, so yes, the sound of monopoles. Now, one question you might ask is, are these particles real? Are they real things? We've, we've uh, uh, electrons, protons, photons, you think of those as real um, particles, but are these monopoles really real? Are phonons real? Are magnons real? Are all these excitations of condensed matter um, physics, are they really real particles, or are they just made up things? Well, the point is they're all excitations in field theories. There are excitations in quantum field theories or classical field theories that describe the low energy physics of these materials. And so the great thing is, yes, they are real, because electrons and photons and neutrons, they are all excitations of quantum fields in our best theories of physics at the moment. So these are all basically animals in the same zoo, the stuff which the world is made out of. So yes, we can use these new materials to study, uh, study new universes. The great thing is there's lots of control parameters. So this is a very complicated example, but temperature, pressure, and magnetic field are used to tune this particular complex organic material into all kinds of different phases that include superconductivity, metallic, field-induced spin density waves, a whole lot of richness, lots of things that you can control by various different parameters. So there's a lots of experiments that you can do looking at these new universes. So uh, there we are, the many universes of quantum materials. And I think I might just finish with a bit of poetry, because I think when you look at these new universes, it does fill your soul with poetry. So here is a, um, my conclusion coming from William Blake, where he looked at a grain of sand and said, to see a world in a grain of sand and a heaven in a wild flower, to hold infinity in the palm of your hand and eternity in an hour. So I'll finish there. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you for a very lovely talk. Um, I'm just going to put back the very first slide, which is the Slido slide. It's number two. So for those of you who are on our YouTube channel or live audience, if you want to quickly take that down so that you can ask your questions, we'll give you about 30 seconds to sort of type in your question or take the link down. And then, Alex, are you ready to... There's a microphone behind you you should use. I think there are a couple there of questions go. already, so... Yep. Exactly. Can people hear me, hopefully online as well? So a few questions that we... It's been quite busy, uh, but there are a few really nice questions in here. So this first one is from Manav, um, who is asking us, where is the problem in finding a unified theory of quantum mechanics and relativity? He wants to know sort of what, what's, the, what's the stumbling block at the moment? Well, it's a very good question because uh, we do have this issue that we know that our fundamental theories are not quite right because we have this fantastic theory of 
gravitation, general relativity, which we know describes all kinds of properties extremely well. The discovery of gravitational waves was one of those discoveries which, which was hugely exciting because of what it opens up in astronomy, but in one sense it wasn't a surprise. Every physicist was really expecting gravitational waves to be there because general relativity is such a good theory of the universe and of cosmology and has been tested incredibly well. Our theory of microscopic interactions, quantum mechanics, is our best tested um, theory. Quantum uh, QED, quantum electrodynamics, has been tested to 12 decimal places. So we know in the realms in which they work, they work brilliantly, but they don't quite match. And so the, the issues that we have, I think, in terms of trying to find the grand unified theory, unifying quantum mecha mechanics and general relativity, and maybe somebody here will be the person who succeeds in doing it, but the problem we've really had, I think, is that um, one of the most promising avenues for solving this, which is string theory, has made, in particular, the supersymmetric aspects of string theory, uh, have been enormously mathematically rich and seem to have, have generated a lot of progress in theory development, but they've had no experimental justification at all. I mean, nothing. And in particular, the supersymmetric particles that were predicted that should have shown up at the Large Hadron Collider have so far not been found. Now, maybe with the new upgrade, uh, some supersymmetric particles will be found, but so far there hasn't even been a hint. And so people are starting to worry, maybe this, was, this great theoretical direction was barking up the wrong tree. My own personal prejudice, and it's probably no more than a prejudice, but I think looking back at the history of science, very often these mainstream developments like string theory, um, which seem very promising and go a long way and start generating a lot of stuff, very often the best theories come from almost nowhere. So I'm hoping that there's going to be a maverick theory that comes up from uh, some you know, strange place which turns out to be the one which... Uh, which finally succeeds in, in unifying quantum mechanics and general, general relativity. Thank you. Um, another popular question uh, seems to be, uh, I mean, so, so someone wants to know, what is your, this is Becca, she wants to know, what is your thought in terms of, or at least, which one do you prefer out of the many worlds theory of quantum mechanics and the Copenhagen interpretation? Well, I, I, again, these are, these are philosophical questions which are, which are wi uh, very wide-ranging. So, uh, yes, another issue we have with quantum mechanics is it's our best-tested theoretical um, theory, our best-tested theory in physics, but we don't quite know what it means. And so we have these different interpretations of quantum mechanics that uh, various people are pursuing, um, often having heated arguments about, but for which there is no experimental um, proof one way or the other of which is correct. And so at the moment it's an open question. I think I would want to sort of say as a, um, you know, it's, physics has always pr progressed the best way because of experiments, because experiments have usually surprised us and they've caused the, the development of physics to go in a completely different fashion. If you look at the history, for example, of electromagnetism in the 19th century, uh, when it's taught in school, it always, always sounds like a whole series of you know, heroic achievements where the next you know, Faraday and Lenz's law and Maxwell's equations and all of these sorts of things all progress in a nice linear fashion. If you read the actual history, there are all kinds of false turns, all kinds of theories which were half right but half wrong that look very plausible, often done by famous people who are perhaps known better for the things that were 100% correct. And what basically gave you a correction back onto the right path was experiment. And you know, that's one of my issues about supersymmetric particles. There's been no experimental justification. So I think when you don't have experimental justification one way or the other, it's best to keep an open mind. You know, I think that's the right thing to do. So um, I think most physicists use Copenhagen interpretation just because it's the way the world looks. It looks like the wave function collapses. Uh, the many worlds theory has certain advantages if you want to basically take the Schrodinger equation as your absolute. So basically, if you say the Schrodinger equation is my one true principle, that's my one equation, everything else has to bow down to the Schrodinger equation, then you're pretty much forced into a many worlds picture. But then, of course, you have to then take all of these extra universes that we don't directly probe. So I think I would say it's right for physicists to keep an open mind.
just because we don't have the experimental evidence one way or the other. Fantastic. Uh, this one is a bit much more closely related to your talk. So uh, this is from Toby, and they have asked, do these quasi-particles such as magnons and phonons obey traditional conservation laws? It's a very, yeah, very good question. Yes, they do. They do. And in fact, the way in which we do these measurements where you can measure their energy-momentum relation, what we call a dispersion relation, of which the simplest is you know, the equation for a kinetic energy, um, E equals P squared over 2M, where P is the momentum. But the, the kind of energy-momentum relationships you have for phonons and magnons, for example, we measure those by doing, as I, as I was explaining, by colliding them, for example, with neutrons. You fire a neutron in and it bounces off a phonon. And what you then do is you conserve energy and momentum. So uh, energy and momentum is certainly conserved, and you, you use that when you're doing these billiard ball experiments with, with, with neutrons. They will also sometimes have some other conservation laws involved with them as well, because, for example, with magnons, they have a, a magnon will have a particular um, angular momentum because it's to do with spin angular momentum. So you also have to think about angular momentum as well. So all of the conservation laws that you're familiar with in you know, A-level physics, they are all important in quantum mechanics. The only difference is that we tend to interpret them in terms of symmetries. So there is this sort of new picture that you have and you will see later on in your physics careers where we sort of move slightly away from conservation laws and start thinking more about underlying symmetries. So this connection between symmetry and conservation law is very important. Fantastic. Sam asks, in the game of life, can you predict the outcome before running it? Excellent question, yes. So in fact, yes, that, um, thank you to Sam for making this point, which uh, uh, I think really illustrates what, I was, what I, I was trying to say. With the game of life, you have, you have the rules. You can put the rules into a computer and you can iterate, and that's how I made all of those animations that I showed you. And if you go onto the web or use you know, an iPad app, you can play all those kind of games with the games of life, and it's just iterating those rules. So yes, you can calculate it. But one of the reasons I wanted to show you all of those things is because they're surprising. You know, the outcomes are surprising. You see the Canada goose and you think, where did that come from? I looked at the rules. There was no Canada goose in those rules. And of course, there are even more complicated things. And this really is my point. If you have the theory of everything, yes, that might give you calculational advantages. Although, as I was pointing out, when systems become big, actually you can't do the calculations because there aren't enough atoms in the universe to build a computer to do those calculations. Yes, the, theory, the, the outcomes are constrained by your theory of everything, but the outcomes are surprising. And so there's all this kind of unlocked potential in these innocuous rules that give you all this complicated stuff. Now, in some sense, we shouldn't be surprised by this because if you, for example, go into mathematics and you take one of the richest areas of, of, um, of mathematics, which is number theory. And some of you who are budding mathematicians may know that there are all these, you know, some of the brightest minds in mathematics have worked on number theory and produced all this kind of complicated stuff about the behavior of integers and primes and all the patterns. You could argue, well, number theory, it's just adding up, isn't it? It's just numbers. You start with zero, you add one, and you get one. You add another one, and you get two. That's number theory. There's nothing else in there. But of course, it's the richness of the patterns that come out of number theory, even though the basic substrate is just a line of integers. You know, that just shows you richness emerges even from simplicity. You know, this number theory is just so unbelievably rich. Fantastic. Just a couple more physics ones, and then we've got a more general one. So the next physics one is from Max, and they have asked, um, are there any engineering uses that these new universes could have? Well, a, a lot of, although I've been basically trying to persuade you that these exotic materials are fantastic playgrounds for physics, the other great thing is that many of them are actually useful. So you can use superconductors you know, to make MRI magnets, or some of these things will have all kinds of applications. So yes, I think the world, the world of engineering will use materials that come out of condensed matter physics. That's certainly true. And of course, you just have to look at your your iPhone or your iPad, which is you know, liquid crystal displays, semiconductor memories, all of these kinds of things, or processes, all of these things come out of condensed matter physics, even though that's kind of not what drives us to develop them. Fantastic. Another physics question from Chris. Uh, when light is absorbed and then emitted by electrons in the lattice, what determines what direction they are sent, and why doesn't it take a different amount of time for different packets of light to get through the material? 
Uh, well, it can, do, it can take different amounts of time for different frequencies, for example, of light to go through, and so different packets of light, I guess that's one way of looking at it. And of course, you all know that from you know, dispersion in optical media, the fact that uh, you know, light, when it goes through a lens, uh, it would, depending on the wavelength, there's a slightly different refractive index. It is a weak function of, um, of wavelength, and in some materials, that can be a big effect. So typically, it depends on the atom. If you absorb light in an atom, so in some atoms it will be re-emitted isotropically. Sometimes it will be anisotropic, and that does depend on the nature of the atom, which is a complex issue, but optical properties is a big area in, in, in physics. So it, sometimes it can be uniform in all directions. Sometimes it can be anisotropic. And then you have to add this up for every single atom. So working out refractive indices from first principles is, is non-trivial. Fantastic. And final question, perhaps, is what would be your advice to young people who decide that they want to have a career in physics or physics research? Go for it. I mean, I think you should, you should do whatever is your passion. And I think, you know, for, for all the people here, if you're doing the Physics Olympiad, I'm sure you're all people who find physics exciting, otherwise you wouldn't be here. And I think whatever you do in life, you should do it with passion and do it with enthusiasm. So if physics is your passion, just go for it. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you very much, Professor Blundell. This is a very lovely talk which tells you something about how the universe really works, more than just, say, particle physics. There's more richness in the world, more is different, and that's a mantra that I would love you sort of to take on. Um, I wanted to say congratulations again to those who are prize winners, okay? And even if you're not a prize winner today, I hope that you're infused and encouraged to do physics, okay? It is, it is one of the most amazing things that humankind has been able to do, that we've been able to think about things and be able to use those very simple laws, produce an understanding of how the universe works, and to engineer things from this process. Okay, so we we're talking about applications as one of the final questions, and I hope whatever you end up doing, that this forms the basis, physics forms the basis of whatever you might end up doing. Okay, so thank you very much for listening, and thank you again, Professor Blundell.